Um, yeah, you know, uh, but I think it's it goes, you know, beyond that. You know, this whole thing of All Souls Day. Um, you know, if it is going to be something like prayer for the dead, uh, then, um, then I think we are, you know, getting into error. It's uh, totally unnecessary. But if it's something to just remember and give thanks to God for the ones, you know, the loved ones who have gone on to be with Him, or, you know, then it's absolutely fine. So that's my, yeah, understanding and uh, how I would react to it. Yeah, Shani. So I had a question about when you were saying about the gifts of the Spirit, because you talked in saying that you have to use your faith. So I know I, I was told that like faith can't work in an unforgiving heart, insecure heart, guilt, condemnation, embarrassment, shame. So my thing is that if somebody has that and you say you have to use your faith for the gifts of the spirit, that means that they won't be able to obtain no gifts. And if somebody does have the gifts and they have unforgiveness or shame or insecurity, all those things, do they lose their gift of the spirit? I hope that makes sense. Mm, so, yeah, yeah. So, so the, the understanding is this, you know, when we look at the gifts of the spirit, it's not that, um, you know, when we look at all these, these nine gifts, it's that the Spirit of God manifests or expresses himself, right, through these gifts. So depending on the situation, like depending on whatever is there. Now, uh, whatever the need is, uh, or, you know, depending on our function in the body of Christ, right? So that's the thing, right? Now, what if a person is walking in bitterness, is not walking in love? Uh, we know that faith works through love, right? Which means that the effective working of faith is when we are walking in love, which is again the character and the nature of God, right? But if there is unforgiveness, if there is bitterness, hardness of heart, does that remove the gifts? No, right? Because it is actually expression of the Holy Spirit, which means that, um, well, uh, there's no question of these gifts being removed. And again, in the book of Romans, we see that the the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable or without, without, you know, which means that he doesn't take them back, right? And and also our understanding is that the Holy Spirit is with us. So he, which means he is not removed. He's not taken out of the picture. But the expression of the gifts is limited. In what way? Because there, it, we are not walking in faith, right? Um, the expression of the gift, that is why you know, Paul even writes to Timothy and says, you know, stir up that gift. So in Timothy's case, we, we understand that he was not really, you know, what was limiting him. Paul says, you know, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. He's saying he's encouraging him, you know, you stir up the gifts, you walk in it. In another place also, he says, you know, these gifts, um, you you walk in it. So he's exhorting Timothy. In, his, in Timothy's case, it was, he was withholding because of maybe fear. He was a young man. There were people who were older than him uh, in, the, in, the, in the church where he was pastoring. So maybe it was that. So it could be that. It could be certain other things. It could be neglect, right? Um, and so the expression of the gift is not effective or is not to the fullest measure um, because of something that is hindering, something that is lacking, something that is acting as a barrier, right? And so that is... That is possible, yes, because of hardness of heart, because of unforgiveness. Because we need to be, you know, without bias, without prejudice, uh, in receiving from God, in hearing from Him, in releasing what we are hearing. So all this prejudice and bias is going to taint. Right? The gift of God is perfect, but hearing from Him and releasing those words, it's going to get tainted because of my own prejudice, my own fear, my own bias, my own lack of or maybe hatred for a certain kind of people, right? It's going to get tainted. So, yeah. So that is a definite possibility. But the removal of gifts, well, we can't say that because the Holy Spirit is with us, right? The expression okay. of it, yes, yeah. Thank you. Where You said it says it in Romans, Bobby, irrevocable. Do you, do you remember what the verse? Yeah, yeah. It's Romans um, 11. Mm -hmm. And um, just one second. Uh, just give me a minute. Okay, Romans 11 and verse 29. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah, most of it. Okay, so um, Lucy, what about going to the cemetery and decorating it? Oh, it is okay. In, in follow up to this All, Sa All Souls Day, yeah, by all means, you can go. You can go, you know, put flowers and etc. And you're, as long as you're, you're understanding, you know, and you know that you are actually thanking God for the ones who are, who have gone on. You know, you're not in any way communicating with the dead. You're not in any way, you know, praying to the Lord for the dead, right? So your understanding is this, that we are going, thanking God for their life. Now you can't do anything about it. They are gone. And in memory, you know, you place flowers and whatever. That's, that's perfectly all right. Okay. Okay. Okay, let's get back, you know, to walking in faith, right? We need to walk in love. We need to desire these gifts. We're talking about the release of these gifts, right? And we need to step out in faith. Now, if you look at, um, you know, this scripture, Galatians 3, verse 2, it says, Paul is actually rebuking the Galatian believers, right? Because they were going back to the law. They were saying, you know, they were talking about circumcision, keeping Moses' law. Some people had come and then kind of brought in that teaching yes you're born again that's fine but you need to keep the law yes you're born again that's fine but you need to be circumcised and so in connection with that paul is rebuking the galatian believers and he says you know this is what he says uh, this only i want to learn from you did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith how did you receive the gift how did you receive the gift of the holy spirit right was it by faith verse 5 Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Again, it's a rhetoric question. He's, you know, rhetoric is just asking, stating. Obviously, it's by faith. Because they, that has been the experience of the Galatian church. Again, verse 14, um, he says that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith, right? So he's telling the believers, you know, the gifts of the Spirit, the work of the Spirit, how did that happen in your midst? Is it by law or some kind of formula, some kind of do's and don'ts, or was it by faith? Obvious answer, by faith. Okay, so we need to step out in faith in order to experience the, uh, uh, for the gift of the spirits to, uh, gifts of the Spirit to be expressed through us, right? Okay, so uh, point six and seven, we've already looked at it, that every believer can manifest all the nine gifts. The best gift, gifts, are, that is um, point seven, is about the best gifts being the ones that suit the occasion or take care of the need or which, um, uh, which take care of the, or enable you to do that function for which you are there in the body of Christ, right? Okay. The other thing that we need to understand is that because spiritual things can be can be taught, believers can be taught and trained to learn about these gifts and to walk fully in the expression of these gifts, okay, which is what we are learning, which is what we're doing now, right? Learning about these gifts. And in fact, this is which is what Paul did as he trained the believers in Corinth. He's saying, regarding spiritual gifts, I don't want you to be without knowledge or without understanding. I don't want you to be ignorant, right? So spiritual gifts, spiritual things can be taught. So people, you know, the wrong understanding is that, okay, I cannot be taught about these gifts. Definitely, you know, if you look at, you know, let's say, for example, gifts of tongues, gift of tongues. We can't talk, we can't teach the believer and say, okay, this is how you speak in it. These are the words you speak. Like this is, this should be the utterance. We can't teach them in that way. But we can teach the believer to, to about what scripture says, okay, this is a gift for you. It is, it is for all believers. We can teach. And how does one receive? Who baptizes? How does one receive? We can look at scriptures, look at these examples, and therefore the believer can learn about these gifts. Right? That is how, that is what we did. Right? We looked at the scriptures, we saw the examples, and uh, yes, with faith we receive, we pray and ask the baptizer, Jesus, to baptize us. Right? So the spiritual things can be taught. And the Lord himself, right, when he, um, uh, when he commissioned the uh, 
disciples, this is what he says. He says, you know, you teach them. You teach them all the things that I, uh, as I taught you, you, you continue to teach them, make disciples and, um, and teach them all the things that I, um, that I showed you, that I taught you, teaching them to observe right, all the things. So, yes, spiritual things can be taught. Believers can be taught and trained and how to yield to the Holy Spirit in the accurate release of these gifts. Whereas, yeah, the other thing that we see is that gifts are not compartmentalized, they flow together. Okay, for example, the word of knowledge can flow with gifts of healings. How God releases a word of knowledge, information that somebody, someone here is being oppressed or is having this condition, is having these symptoms in their body or in their mind. Word of knowledge, right? You have no clue, no idea about the audience or about the person with whom you are maybe on a phone call, right? You have no idea that this person is going through, but the Spirit of God reveals that. That's the word of knowledge. You have the word of knowledge, right? Either you see something or you sense something, some prompting in your spirit, and you, you realize that, yes, this person is going through this. So the word of knowledge. Now, why did that word of knowledge come? Because the Lord wants to do something, right? He's revealed so you can share and and... The Lord, and then that person also understands that, hey, I have a God or there is this God who, who knows all about me and he is he's compassionate about me. He cares for me, right? And the gifts of healings take care of the solution, right? Bringing about whatever change that needs to be brought in the body, either to stop those symptoms or, you know, maybe the weight of oppression is taken out, right? And there's a release of shalom, the peace of God, right? So that is the gifts of, gift of healing. So gift of healings, we're specifically talking about physical symptoms and so on, right? Okay, so these flow together, meaning that, you know, all the nine gifts can just flow together, it need not be. See, we are learning it one by one uh, to understand the functioning of it, but the gifts can just flow together, and right? it can be a mix of these gifts like throwing together, okay? Right. And these gifts empower membership gifts and ministry gifts, okay? Like we, we saw, ministry functioning and um, uh, and also the membership function. Okay. Right. So this is, a, this is a very interesting, you know, interesting thing that we note. Many times we make, we come to the wrong conclusion um, or we mix these two things. Okay, one is spiritual maturity, okay, and spirituality, two different things, or spiritual sensitivity. Spiritual maturity is Christ-likeness, right, becoming like Him in character, in, in all aspects, spiritual maturity. But spirituality or moving in the gifts of the Spirit or spiritual power, receiving it, and walking in it, these are two different things, which means that just because a person or a church is spiritually gifted does not mean that they are spiritually mature. Okay. Now, there's a lot of confusion because of that, right? In the body of Christ, we see that, okay, this person is so spiritually gifted, a word of knowledge, is prophesying, and yet in their life, when it comes to character, certain flaws, right? Certain immat immaturity, certain things that they need to, you know, you see it and say, like, hey, this person has to grow up, but then how come uh, the gifting is so strong? And then we sometimes say, oh, maybe it's not of God. Maybe this is the enemy. These are lying wonders, lying gifts, okay? Well, the, the, the thing is this, that a person need not be spiritually mature. At the same time, can be so spiritually sensitive and, you know, in faith and wanting the gifts of the Spirit and so on and walking in it by faith, right? So now, the, the, the thing is this, a classic example of a group of people like this is the Corinthian church itself, right? 
Paul writes to the Corinthian church and he's saying, hey, I cannot speak to you as to mature people. I had to talk to you as to carnal, as to spiritual babes, he says. Why? Because there is envy, there is strife, there is division. Right? You people are fighting amongst one another. You're saying, I'm of Paul. Okay, if you if you look at one Corinthians one, you will understand that um, people are you know, one Corinthians one, and then also one Corinthians three. Sorry, you know, I brethren could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with food, solid food. For until now you're not able to receive it, and you still you're not able, and you are still carnal. For there are where there are envy, strife, and divisions. Are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Okay, so he's saying you are carnal, you're fleshly, right? At the same time, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if you look at uh, verse, verse 5, okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 5, same people, what is he saying? You were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, which means that Hey, you are there. You know, you're walking in all these gifts. It's a spiritually buzzing place, right? You come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord, etc. So this is who you are, right? You are walking in the gifts. You come short in no gifts. In fact, uh, they were really zealous for the spiritual gifts and uh, walking in it. So he had to write to them and say, I know you are zealous, but understand the gifts of the Spirit are to edify the person and to glorify Christ. I know you are zealous, but understand that this is how you use these gifts in church. Right? They are an expression of the Holy Spirit. They are gifts of grace. So he had to really instruct them. Right? So it is possible for people to be immature, for people to be not Christ-like, to be carnal, and be gifted. Right? Or walking in these gifts. Right? Now, so that's that's a possibility. Okay? So just because somebody is gifted, some God uses them in powerfully, doesn't mean that they are spiritually mature or Christ-like. Two different things. And that is why Paul writes 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 1. What does he write? Does anyone can anyone read the verse? 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1. Yeah, go ahead. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Okay, the first part of it. What does he say? Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. Okay, first, let's just look at those two words. Pursue love. Okay, the word used there is agape. So he's saying, go after. Let that be yours. Why are you going after it? Because you want it to be yours. The love of God, you want it to be in you expressed in you right so what is love the very nature character of god you know if you look at chapter 13 okay in one Corinthians, chapter 13 is all about the love of god right he's talking about the gifts and he's saying hey if you have all these gifts but you don't have love which is really agape god kind of love then it's a waste right you might have these gifts you might talk in tongues, you might pray in tongues, but it's it's just a clanging noise. It's absolutely noisy, right? Now, you might have all these utterances and all that, but it's it's just a clanging, clanging symbol, he says. And uh, you might have faith to remove mountains, and but if you don't have love, you are nothing. Okay, so what is he saying? He's talking about the love of God. He's talking about the character of God. He's talking about the nature of God. In other words, Christ-likeness. He's saying, pursue that. Go after that. But that's one part of the whole thing. Part of the whole, right? Part of the story. Second part is desire spiritual gifts. Right? Go after the character. Go after the power, the presence of God. Right? In other words, it's just, it's just go after him fully. Don't just say, okay, I want only character. I want only integrity. I want only thing. That's only part of it. That's a good part. Yes, but that's still a part of who God is. He's saying, go after the whole. Go after the fullness, which is character and power, so that you might express 
you might ex you know why because you might be witnesses with power right you might witness you might witness fully as god himself wants you to witness witnesses with power right so saying pursue that desire that and go after the gifts as well okay, so that also needs to be our mindset that we will pursue love and desire spiritual gifts yes shani so if somebody has spiritual gifts but they don't have spiritual maturity for what i i want to make sure i'm understanding in terms of um you're saying that they may um sorry they don't they don't have spiritual maturity they may have like um i guess you said like i'm forgetting this shame carnal so does that mean that these people are having a gift but does that mean that they're just limiting their their gifts also yeah absolutely so they will be you know they might be sharp in the gifting but over a period of time if you are if they are not growing into christ likeness you know it's going to be uh the expression of these gifts is going to be tainted right and um, and then we see that other things creep in right they rather than glorifying god they end up bringing dishonor to the body of christ there's a lot of things happen because of manipulation there's a lot of things happen because of misrepresentation and and you know if you if you look at it why is there an apprehension about the power of god why is there an apprehension about these gifts in the body of christ in the first place it's because of misrepresentation it's because you know people see their lives people see their you know their gifting and then this they decide that hey their lives is not in sync with whatever they are sharing with whatever they are their lives are not in sync and i don't want any part of it or they say okay you know how can you be call yourself a christian how can you do these things uh, in ministry and and yet in your own personal life you know not have the you know not have these things foundation so um it, it in the long run it brings dishonor in the long run it you know it opens doors for errors to creep in and so on like um you know during the orientation time here we 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 learned about these god's generals you know these generals of faith and looking at some of the things that they did well some some of the things that they did not do well right and uh, and the thing is this they did not really um, they lacked the fear of the lord they uh, in some cases and in some cases they didn't really take care of uh, the, of pursuing christ likeness in their lives right personal lives and uh, therefore it ended up bringing this on up yeah okay yes thank you Thanks, right okay the other thing that we see is that the gifts of the spirit are not within or not to be restricted within the walls of the church right or you know when i'm gathering together for prayer when i'm gathering together to for worship or when i'm having a you know church service the gifts of the spirit are not to be you know restricted only in such an environment the gifts of the spirit can be manifest anywhere in fact that is how it should be right in your marketplace in the place of study in the place in the workplace right the gifts of the spirit to be manifest you know practically you know how how do we practically do that well we don't have to you know kind of lay hands and you know close ask everybody to close their eyes and do that but it can be a simple conversation right maybe the lord gives a word of knowledge a word about the other person maybe some difficulty that they are having in their lives maybe some kind of a symptom that they are experiencing in their body right and we can just ask gently ask as part of a conversation hey are you you know are you going through this right and that genuinely sparks curiosity in that person and the person says hey how did you know right i didn't share it with anyone how did you know then we share jesus and we say okay we can pray right and uh, we can pray you know i can pray for you and maybe there's a private space we'll we'll pray for you and so on so the gifts of the spirit are to be manifest right there in the marketplace right and even for us personally you know it's just not in the public gathering that we pray you know uh, or in our quiet times that we pray in the spirit but we pray or pray in tongues you know we pray everywhere so that we can be edified right and of course we don't have to scream and shout the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet right so you don't have to scream and shout uh, if you want to you can scream and shout but we can you know do so just between us and the lord pray in the spirit be edified in the in the inner man right so it's not just limited for 
the church service or a you know church environment or a bible study environment no it's it really is to be manifest in the marketplace out there right in our everyday routine because god wants to be expressed or god wants to express himself to the people who are lost to the people who are hurting he wants to show himself strong uh, to to everyone around right okay Um, the gifts of the Spirit can be used to minister to all kinds of people. Okay, the question is, okay, should it be only for believers or should it be also for unbelievers? Right, obviously, for all kinds of people, right? Um, and then people ask, you know, but that person is not a believer, not doesn't believe in Jesus, more so, right? Uh, maybe it's a prophetic word, you know, a word of encouragement, more so, right? A word that, that uh, points them to Jesus, right? So all kinds of people... Um, maybe people who do not know, people who know, all kinds of people, right? Um, okay. Right, so uh, how do we do that? You know, how do we, um, exp uh, how do we kind of build up or raise the expectation, desire, and faith of people in the gathering for, in, in the gathering for the gifts of the spirits to be gifts of the spirit, sorry, to be expressed. Okay, so we can share. We can share stories. We can share testimonies. Um, preach and teach the word. Demonstrate. Right. Um, we share about how you know God has worked in your own life. Maybe you can share how God worked in other people's life. Preach and teach. Meaning, this is how the gifts operate. Teach the people. So people come from you know different church backgrounds, right? maybe unchurched backgrounds, without any kind of expectation. And then when they receive a revelation, okay, this is for us, right? Or, you know, I can be ministered to in this manner, or I can minister in this manner. Then, they, you know, they get an understanding of it, then they receive it and walk in it, right? So preaching and teaching is very important. As important as teaching and preaching is, it's also important to demonstrate Right? What is demonstration? That you yourself walk in it. Right? When you're praying for them, when you're ministering with them, you, you expect the Lord to give you a word. You expect the Lord to, uh, you know, maybe show you things, and and you expect the Lord to heal. And so demonstrate, right, in your own life. So when you when you just testify and when you demonstrate is a powerful example. Okay. Okay. Here's another thing. The gifts of the Spirit have to be tested. In the New Testament testing, or, or, or in the New Testament setting, this is what we see as an instruction. Okay, uh, If you turn to 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 to 21, okay, this is point 16 of what we are studying. Right? 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. Okay? So Paul writes, do not quench the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is doing something, don't stop. You know, Don't quench. Do not despise prophecies okay despising meaning don't hate don't put it aside right welcome it so do not despise prophecies and the third instruction in in line with that is test all things okay so he's specifically talking about prophecy he's saying test all things right and on and about the gifts of the spirit also test all things okay what does it mean to test it means to examine to discern is it good? Is it bad? Is it from the Lord? Is it not from the Lord? Right? Is it based on the word or not? Test all things. And then hold fast, which means hold on tightly to what is good. Okay? Something that is valuable, something that is sincere, honest, sorry, not just sincere, but truthful, honest, and something that is worthy. So when it comes to prophecy, when it comes to you know the word of knowledge or word of wisdom and all these things, test it examine it and hold on to it right that's the instruction hold on to what is good which means we are not supposed to hold on to what is what is if he says hold on to what is good it also means don't hold on to what is what is bad or what is not good okay which also talks about the possibility of 
something that is not so good. Something that is good, something that is not so good. So when it comes to these spiritual gifts, right? when it comes to the expression of these gifts, so he's saying, when it comes to prophecies, hold on to what is good, what is honest, what is you know worthy, hold on to it. And uh, But why should we test? You know, that's the thing. Okay, he's saying test these gifts, hold on to what, what, why is it that there is a possibility of something that is not so good? Right? Hey, these gifts are from God. Yes or no? They're saying, you know, that's why they are called the gifts of the Spirit. They're not called gifts of man. Right? They're so called gifts of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is a source. He has it, has these gifts, and he's releasing. Then why test it? What do you think? Why should we test? Examine. Investigate, discern. Why should we do it? Because there's hindrance from Satan. Because there is hindrance from Satan to to stop these gifts. To stop these gifts, okay. Or to manifest these gifts. Hmm. Yeah. So to maybe to influence, to infiltrate. Yeah. That's a possibility. Right? So the first and foremost thing is that the gift of God is good. We need to understand that God is good. What comes from his, Him is good. It's good. But you see, these gifts are expressed. These are expression of the Holy Spirit. But these are expressed through us, people, right? Who are growing, who are works in progress, right? Who are growing to be accurate, more and more accurate. So there could be, so that's the reason, you know, there could be things that out of our own flesh, we add certain things, we delete certain things maybe out of our own flesh, right? Out of our own, I don't know, maybe zeal, right? We could add certain things or out of our fear, we could delete certain things, right? To whatever God is saying. So Paul is saying, you need to test. You need to test these things, right? And the t test is, okay, does it agree with the word of God, right? The, the, whatever the spirit, whatever you think the spirit is saying, does it, is it in agreement with the word of God or is it totally contradicting the word of God, right? Is it totally opposite of the word of God? Then we know that, oh, God would never say it because his word will not contradict what the spirit is leading, right? The will of God, the leading of God will not be in contradiction with the word because the word is the will of God. The word is the nature of God, right? So it is based on the word. Okay, so is it in accordance to scripture? Does it glorify God? Yeah, yeah, yes, okay. So these are some things, right? Is it in accordance with the word of God? Is it in accordance with the nature of God, the character of God, right? Something that is being brought. So we are called to test, discern, Hold on to what is good. So the New Testament instruction to the body yeah, uh, is this. Uh, did someone want to ask a question? Um, OK. Right. Um, I'm sorry, just one second. Okay, um, just plugged in the charger. Sorry. Okay, so the, so that's the understanding, right? So, so therefore, the instruction, the exhortation is to test. Okay, so which means that okay, I'm so confident that God has spoken. You know, I all I almost want to say, "Thus says the Lord, dear brother. Thus says the Lord, dear sister." You know, go do it. This is God saying, you. You know, you're sure, sure, you're so sure. But I need to humble myself. We need to, one has to humble oneself and say, you, you know, this is the word, but you test, right? We need to be humble enough to say, this is, I, I sense this is what God is saying, 
but you receive it, you test it, right? And you receive confirmation on it, and then you act according to it. We should be humble enough to just submit that word to whoever's to whom to whomever it is directed to. Right? So I pray with you. And I receive a word, and I, and I, yeah, of course, I, I would say that this is, I, this is what I sense God is saying. On your part, you need to say, okay, it could be anyone, right? It could be, you know, the person who you, who you look up to, the man of God, the woman of God, whoever. But your responsibility as a believer is to test. Okay? It's not just because you test the word that has been given to you, it does not mean that. You are in any way disrespecting the person, dishonoring the person, right? You know, this prophet came and this bus, you know, prophet came and delivered this word and gave this and said, blah, 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 all these things is going to happen in your life, right? You're not disrespecting the person just by saying, no, I'm going to test it with the word, right? You receive it and you're saying, okay, does the word of God say this? You're not dis, uh, dishonoring that person. You're, in fact, you're doing the right thing by discerning according to the word of you're doing the right thing this is what the scriptural uh you know example is uh, or what his construction is right so and as a person who's delivering uh, delivering the word who's giving the word again right you should not feel you know what is this you know, I'm, i've given a word this person is not acting on it and right? this person is not doing it no just submit it we need to be humble enough to submit it and say this is what I sense God saying. God is speaking. God is, you know, God is directing. Uh, uh, but then you test, and you so you, you know, you submit uh, to the instruction of God's word, and you know. So in in both cases, there is that safety, right? Okay, I think there's a question. Yeah. So you're saying that um, yeah. we should tell somebody that uh, I guess this is this is what I'm sensing God is saying, but tell them to. To test it out, you're saying we should tell that to, to the person. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Okay. To say, okay, you know, this is what I sense God is saying, but you pray, you test, right? Um, you check. Now, if, if the other person is a is a Christian, is a believer, well, they would go back to the word, they would check, they would test. You know, if there could be, um, you know, a simple direction like uh, maybe to an unbeliever about the heart of God, about the nature of God, a word of knowledge, maybe. We can ask it in the form of a question, right? Saying, okay, you know, this is what I sense God saying. Is it true in your life? Now, do you have this thing in your life? Rather than saying, God saying this, God is doing this, and, and you know, without giving the person an option, right, to consider uh, and to test. Right? We should give that person the option and the, uh, and, and the opportunity to test because that is what Scripture uh, asks us to do. Right, and and that is the reason for the testing. You know, it's not that God's word is doubtful or wishy-washy, right? It is that it is coming from God. It's coming. It is perfect. But we, as believers, we as people who are learning, you know, and growing and changing from glory to glory, we are still works in progress. There will be certain things that will be accurate. There will be certain things that are. For example, I just share this, share this, right? Um, you know about prophecy. There was this, you know, is, is a, like God is using this person as a prophet. Okay, so that is his ministry. Now he was praying for a couple, right? And the need of the couple was that uh, you know that they that they didn't have any children, and you know they wanted to be prayed for, and and so he prayed, and God showed him a word, right? That you know by this time next year, you will have a baby. Okay, so. Wow, wonderful. So he shared, right? But he was also, you know, he also knew them personally. He knew their need. But in his excitement, he said, by this time next year, you will have a baby boy. Okay. In his excitement. Wow. All good. They all went back. Same time next year. They wrote back to the prophet saying, thank you, brother so-and-so. You know, Yorumba. We just want to testify that God gave us a baby. There's just one correction. It's a girl baby, not a boy baby. <laughs> right? And then, well, the prophet had the humility to write back to them and say, and say, you know, I made a mistake. 
right? Well, God did show that he was giving you a baby. So I, I was so happy and I shared that. But in my excitement, I just added that, you know, the gender part of it and said, boy, baby. Whereas, you know, that was my own excitement, my own, you know, happiness for you both in, in, in which I said this. Well, so in his humility, he, you know, he corrected himself and said this, right? So, well, God, God's gift is perfect and is so accurate and all that. But we, in our, you know, in, in our striving for growth and understanding, we, we make mistakes, right? Okay, let's move on. Okay, we. I, I want to come back to chapter five a little later. Okay, uh, after we after we are done with uh, going through the gifts. Okay, so let's go to um, uh, chapter seven. Okay? Chapter six is about our spirit senses, and we looked at it in detail. Uh, the spirit sense of feeling, um, you know, uh, and so on. Like just like how uh, how we have our five physical senses, we look. We saw that there is a parallel in our spirit, like we can see in our spirit, we can hear in our spirit, right? Uh, we can sense in our spirit, and we must be open as we are praying, as we are waiting on God. We must be open to sense things in our spirit, man. So we looked at that in detail, right? So um, let's go to chapter seven uh, in you know any books. Okay, yeah. So gifts of tongues. So we see that um, in 1 Corinthians 12, we see this list. Okay, and we see um, verse 10, it says different kinds of tongues. Okay, it's listed there. Different kinds of tongues as one of the gifts of spirit. So let's look at that. Okay, different kinds of tongues. What is it? It is a supernatural ability, like we saw, to speak in the languages, right? It's languages of men. Or language of angels. In other words, earthly language or a heavenly language. Okay. So 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1 says, you know, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, tongues of men, earthly language, tongues of angels, heavenly language. So, you know, different kinds of tongues. We see that, you know, when we look at the gifts of tongues, we see that there are different kinds of tongues. You know, one is a tongues which is given as a personal prayer language for our personal edification right for our personal edification so we are edified even as we pray and it's just between you you and god you are praying in tongues you pray more often and you are being personally edified you receive revelation from the holy spirit the mysteries of god are made known to you well there are sometimes certain things that we don't know what we should pray for you know, Romans chapter 8, verses 25, 26 talks about that. We don't know what we should pray for, but the Holy Spirit gives us those utterance and we speak. Sometimes we have weaknesses, right? We have shortcomings and we want to overcome those. Well, the Holy Spirit enables us how again through praying in tongues. So these are ways by which we are personally edified. So the tongues, different kinds of tongues that the, uh, or the gift of tongues is for personal edification. So the use of tongues is for personal edification. Second thing, second thing that we see is that it could be for intercession for others, right? One is for you. The other thing is it's used as an intercession for others. Why? Because Holy Spirit knows the needs of the others, of others, right? So it's used as deep intercession for others in groanings and words which cannot be uttered because um, the Holy Spirit knows the needs. And so it could be for interpretations. Thirdly, um, sorry, intercession. Thirdly, it is used as, an, as a message to the church. For example, Paul writes and he says, if somebody speaks in tongues to a gathering in a church, let it be with interpretation. Otherwise, how will they know? How will they understand? Right? And that is what we see in um, 1 Corinthians 14. Right, it says, um, um, 
in verse 5, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. He uses that word greater, meaning there is benefit to the church only if they understand, right? if they are receiving edification. You might be personally edified, but how will the church be edified unless there is understanding or interpretation? Right, so he says, um, unless indeed he interprets that the church may uh, ed receive edification. Verse six. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with new tongues, with tongues, sorry, how what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? Okay, and so he's talking in this whole uh, passage about interpretation of tongues. If there's a message in church, if there is a you know if there is a, a you know a public address of the gathering in tongues, there needs to be interpretation. So there are uh, again talks about how tongues can be interpreted interpreted right to the church congregation, and tongues also you know it talks about the fourth one. We'll stop with this. It talks about how tongues is a sign to the unbeliever. Okay, the example that we see. Is in Acts chapter 2. How the disciples who were there, the 120 who were there, who were filled with the Holy Spirit, they started speaking in tongues, praising God in other tongues. And it was a sign to the unbelievers. Right? There were people who had gathered there, Jewish people from the neighboring areas, and they heard their own languages being spoken. And therefore, it was a sign. This is something amazing. Right? They were, they, they heard God's word being spoken, God being praised in their own language through people who did not know the language, for sure. Right? So it, it was a sign that pointed about something supernatural happening. It was a sign that pointed to the fact that God was something, God was releasing something. Right? And so it gave an opportunity for Peter to share the word. And after the word, people ask them the question, what must we do? Right? It gave them an opportunity to ask the question. And then Peter shares and says, so this is what you must do. And then we see that thousands were saved that day. They came to the saving knowledge of Christ. So it's a sign to the unbeliever. A sign board always points. right? A sign always points. It could be an arrow pointing, saying, OK, this is it. This is the way you should go. This is the answer. This is the destination. So tongues is also a sign to the unbeliever. OK, OK, we'll continue uh, next class onwards. Probably we'll move a little quicker right, with the gifts. OK, thank you. God bless.